Hello there and Happy New Year. Welcome back to the channel Russia in Context. Now, with the first week of 2024 under our collective belts, I thought it best to follow through with a resolution I made to myself and the channel. See, over the holidays, I spoke with plenty of friends and family who live outside of Russia, and I realized that aside from a few tentpole news events, the majority of what's going on inside this country is a mystery to you all. Now, as someone who closely follows the news here in Russia, it seems like a good idea to share that with all of you, to do something of a weekly recap, let's say. So let's have a rundown of all the big news stories of the holiday season here in Russia. Now, obviously the first week of the year in Russia is in some ways a slow one, as January 1st through the 8th are all official non-working holidays. A fact which always seems awesome until you realize that they account for approximately 60% of all days off in a calendar year, after which you kind of wish that they spaced them out a bit more. But anyways, although most rang in the New Year's around tables with friends and family, in the border region of Belgorod, the first days of 2024 saw a series of attacks from Ukraine. Now, this was almost certainly in response to the December 29th Russian air attacks on Ukraine, which killed over 30 people and might have been the largest yet. The first attack on Russian soil was on the 30th of December, when 24 people were killed and over 100 others injured in the regional city of Belgorod, a, a, a city of about 340,000 people. Now, in response to this, the Russian military launched a barrage of missiles at numerous Ukrainian cities, with Kharkov receiving the brunt of the attention. Now, this back-and-forth exchange calmed down considerably after the first, but not a day has gone by when there hasn't been some news of air sirens or air defense systems going off over Belgorod. With news from the front lines gone relatively quiet over the last month or so, this was something of a shock, an uncomfortable reminder on the eve of the country's largest holiday that there's still a war going on. The first week of 2024 also saw a cold wave settle in over many regions of Russia, with temperatures in Moscow remaining around negative 20 to negative 23 degrees Celsius, with wind chills often closer to negative 30, and more rural areas hit the negative 30 mark with ease, and wind chills were around negative 40. But this is Russia, right? It's cold. This isn't anything huge or different or even news, right? Well, sometime around the 4th of January, stories began to creep into the news feeds about tens of apartment buildings, sometimes over a hundred, losing electricity or even worse and more frequently, heat. The problems themselves actually began when the mercury dropped, so basically on the night of the first, but issues of utilities happened, so it wasn't until the stories began to regularly pop up from Moscow, the surrounding suburbs, and other major cities around the country that a trend made itself known. For people not familiar with how heating works in Russia and many countries of the former Soviet Union, cities have massive thermal power plants, which burn natural gas to produce both electricity and hot water, the latter of which is then pumped out through massive pipes, typically buried in the ground, though they can sometimes be found elevated and insulated above ground. These pipes are the source of hot water for washing your hands, doing the dishes, taking a shower, all that stuff. But most importantly, in the winter, they are what course through the radiators found in every room of every apartment. Now, stories of burst pipes with hot water turning the ground to steaming mud or roads into rivers or worse yet, flooding apartments and corridors in residential buildings, those became quite common. That said, sometimes the problem was less critical, simply massive sections of a city losing electricity for hours, if not days, but losing both heat and electricity was not uncommon either. The reason this is such a huge scandal, aside from thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people being without electricity and heat in extremely cold conditions, is the fact that this is Russia, a country which prides itself on the cold climate stereotype. I mean, 
I remember a few years ago when Texas got hit by what for them qualified as a snowstorm and whole communities were without utilities for days because anything approaching winter weather just doesn't happen down there. And as a Midwesterner, I shook my head, sure, but I could also understand their situation. You just don't invest in snow plows and make sure your systems are cold resistant in lands where the temperature rarely ever drops below freezing. That, however, is clearly not the case in Russia. And the weather, though cold, gets this cold almost every single year. So this isn't abnormally cold either. What we witnessed was a small-scale implosion of public utilities in parts of Russia that aren't remote or poor, relatively speaking. Dmitry Peskov, Putin's spokesperson, stated that over the last 10 to 20 years, a huge amount of work has been done to update the utilities infrastructure of the country, but that even in two decades, it's impossible to do everything, which would be easier to swallow if the government readily made available annual reports that detail what exactly they were doing to update said systems. However, I've never seen or heard about anything like this, so if they do publish such information, it's buried deep within the rest of the bureaucratic runoff, which is not really better at all. And if it takes so much time to update the utilities infrastructure, how is it then possible to put everything back into working order in a few days to a week? If it's possible to repair things so quickly in an emergency, what's preventing the needed system overhaul during the months the system isn't supplying vital heat? Now, again, maybe there are some engineering or other technical difficulties that would explain away these pretty obvious questions, but if so, maybe just, I don't know, explain all that? Quick aside, the irony of the situation must be painful for those cognizant of it. Now, for those who don't remember, last winter or two winters ago, after Europe announced that they would stop using Russian gas, or at least quit using as so much of it, Margarita Simonyan and Russia Today undertook a PR campaign that just amounted to what they probably thought to be some high-level trolling, but anyway, they just showcased European cities freezing, residents huddled under blankets in their powerless apartments, all of this as a result from turning away from Russian resources. But if we pull up a map of which European cities are currently freezing or without electricity, they're all in Russia. Now, in all likelihood, at least in the Moscow region, the reason for the collapse is connected to extreme urban expansion into suburban areas with new micro-communities designed to house thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of new residents, popping up over the course of a few years. And although it is possible that some of these residential complexes have their own heating systems constructed to make them more independent, I'd wager a bet that the vast majority of them simply get plugged into the pre-existing Soviet-era utility structure. And if that's the case, which it almost certainly is, why has the government been approving all this construction without expanding the necessary utilities? These are systems that were built like 40, 50 years ago when three to four times fewer people were living in the regions. It honestly feels like modern Russia wasted the one advantage that they inherited from the Soviet Union, its infrastructure. One last thing to mention with regards to the cold causing systems, previously thought reliable to fail miserably, transport. Now I'm mainly talking about trains here with some instances of the heating going out in the wagons and passengers being forced to take shelter in the sitting compartments, which weren't really any warmer and other times on high-speed trains like the Lastechka, the modern high-speed train that makes trips between Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod, and the Finist, the Russian-produced version that's supposed to slowly replace the Lastechka as Germany will no longer be servicing them, these trains simply stopped dead on their tracks, leaving passengers in the dark, unable to exit the train, stranded kilometers from the nearest town. Now, in Moscow, the MCD4, an updated form of a commuter train that utilizes 
pre-existing infrastructure to connect the reach of Moscow's public transit even further, these trains saw massive delays for multiple days in a row over the holidays. And for drivers on the final day of the holiday period, January 8th, on the M11 Federal Highway, which connects Moscow and St. Petersburg, a massive 50-car accident left at least four dead, 16 injured, and hundreds, if not thousands, stranded in a traffic cluster that was the result of no one bothering to clean the road of snow. Now, in response to the catastrophe, federal investigators have promised to hold accountable the organization responsible for winter road conditions, but on a federal highway, how is that not the responsibility of the government from the start? A similar scenario occurred on the M4 federal highway in the south, near the city of Rostov-on-the-Don, which leads me back around to the idea that Russia somehow always seems surprised by snow in the winter. I don't get it. The last thing I want to mention with regards to the public services collapse is in the city of Chelyabinsk in the Ural Mountains, Russia's seventh largest city with 1.1 million residents. There, over the holidays, was a collapse on almost all fronts as multiple apartment blocks dealt with the issues discussed earlier, as well as no trash removal leading to bins heaped and overflowing and no snow removal, which made navigating the city extremely difficult. Happy holidays, I guess. Moving away now from the frigid and crumbling, Eastern Orthodox Christians celebrated Christmas on the 7th. Now, the event is a quiet affair, but two interesting news stories came out of it. First is an official government statistic, which states that only 1.4 million Russians celebrated Christmas this year, which I'm taking to mean went to church, which is down from a million just a few years ago. Now, sure, the extreme cold definitely kept some people home, but many were quick to note that if only 1% of the country went to church on what is one of, if not the most important Christian holiday of the year, it seems a strong counterpoint to the narrative of Russia being this overwhelmingly Christian country, with one commentator stating that, quote, if in a country with a population of 140 million, approximately 2 million people take part in Orthodox Christian services, and about 1.5 to 2 million in Muslim services, then there's only about 3 to 5 percent of truly religious people in the country. I don't want to go off down the rabbit hole that this news statistic opens up, um, but it is one that will be worth exploring in the future and something to keep in mind uh, with regards to modern Russia. The other news story connected to Christmas involves a priceless piece of Russian art, the Trinity, an icon by Andrei Rublev what can easily be considered the oldest Russian masterpiece and one of the most important works of art in all of Christendom. And it's being mishandled, endangered. See, on Christmas Eve, the iconic work was transported to Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow from the center where it was undergoing restoration. Uh, and it was transported for Christmas Mass, and then it was announced that the work would remain there until the end of the June. Now, according to Gennady Popov, the assistant director of scientific work at the Andrei Rublev Museum of Ancient Russian Culture and Art, quote, the glass case housing the icon is not temperature controlled. Transport was done in unbelievably cold temperatures. This whole undertaking is ridiculous, and the end result may be a marked deterioration of the icon's condition. There exists the concept of exhausting the safety margins of such a work, something which needs to be taken very seriously and prudently. Wood always reacts to the elements. If you move the icon from place to place, it will end badly. We need to find a location for the Trinity and settle down." Unquote. The newspaper Moskovsky Komsomolets also pointed out that the vases with flowers in the icon's vicinity could easily result in a mold or fungus taking root on this invaluable artifact of Russian history and culture. We've wandered away from the celebrating of Orthodox Christmas, to be sure, but I feel it's important to highlight the needless harm potentially being done to the Trinity icon, especially in light of all the moaning that's done by the powers that be here in Russia about the West attempting to cancel Russian culture. Now, 
even if that really were the case, which it isn't, Russia usually does a pretty solid job of destroying its own history and culture by itself. Case in point. Now, last up, we have a number of laws which were passed in 2023 that went into effect as of January 1st. Some notable laws were that the minimum wage was increased by 18.5%, which sounds like a lot until you realize that it's now 19,242 rubles per month, which is $210. Additionally, a number of pensions were increased by 7.5%, but with general inflation and the increase in the costs of many goods, that was effectively nullified. On the upside, mothers, and in some rare and extenuating circumstances, fathers can retain their maternity leave government pay if they decide to return to work before their child reaches 18 months of age. Citizens will be able to choose to have their biometric data entered into or deleted from a national database. Producers of packaging, such as plastic bottles or cardboard boxes, will be more responsible for making sure that these recyclables are recycled properly, or they will pay a fee, and since I'm not sure what the former option would look like, I'm assuming they'll just be paying more to the government. Banks and microloan organizations will be forced to calculate how much of a person's salary would go towards paying off a potential loan, and if it's more than half of the salary, they will have to inform the person in written form. This is just a good thing in general. Sports programs for all ages will receive increased government funding thanks to increased fees on bookies. Extra measures have been put into place to prevent forest fires in response to 2023, setting records for total area of Russia burnt to the ground, but we'll see how effective these new measures are. Convicts will now have a probation rehabilitation program to help them readapt and reintegrate into society. Thumbs up there. And of course, the window for mandatory military service has expanded from 18 years old to 30 years old, uh, with the old cap being 27 years old. So an additional three years of young men from which they can pull. Some of these laws I mentioned uh, in my last video, recapping legislation from 2023, and I'll have a follow-up video going into more detail um, of some of those that I just mentioned and others in addition, so keep your eyes open for that. Obviously, there were other small news stories, but for the big picture, for the big events and everything that really happened here over the holiday season, uh, the first week plus a day here in Russia, that covers you for now. Um, if you enjoyed this video and it's this type of content information about what's happening here in Russia, if you like to see this, uh, leave a comment below the video, give the video a like, give me some sort of feedback to let me know that this is of interest to you. It's obviously something that I am quite interested in, so I plan on pushing forward with it anywhere, anyway. Uh, again, right, the resolution I mentioned at the beginning of the video. That said, though, if this is something that, uh, I don't know, gets some good feedback, uh, I will definitely be putting more time and effort into it as it is right now. It's just kind of a quick gathering of, of trends that I've noticed emerging. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. So that has been a recap of news in Russia this week, and this has been Russia in Context. Thanks for watching.